I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, Jordan, a nation which has to cope with external shocks, refugees, energy shortages and warring neighbours. We look at whether Amman can steer the kingdom's fragile recovery from the rise of the Islamic State in Iraq. Also this week, price hikes in Egypt. President Sisi is making his mark on the economy. But how will the people cope with reduced subsidies? And how long will the billions from the Gulf keep saving an economy from bankruptcy? And rival candidates say they won Indonesia's election. Whoever emerges as president, though, will have plenty on their plate with this rising Asian giant. So Jordan's not a country you hear much about economically. It just seems to you know, keep on ticking over without much fanfare or drama. But there is drama, or at least a whole host of economic shocks, which continue to shape the direction of the country. There's rising debt, warring neighbours, energy shortages, and of course the millions of refugees, all of which mean Jordan needs more than a bit of economic help. For example, it has received $5 billion from the Gulf states, mostly for infrastructure projects, which in turn should create jobs. Then you've got the United States took an unusual step here uh, of guaranteeing Amman's debt. That's allowed it to raise more than $2 billion there. And even the International Monetary Fund has chipped in with $2 billion of its own. Now you might question why one country deserves such generosity, but just think about this. The refugee situation alone, Jordan's taken in more than 750,000 refugees since just the Syrian conflict began, taking the total number of Syrians in the country to 1.3 million. That is 10% of Jordan's population. It's burdens like that, as well as fluctuating gas supplies from Egypt, which have pushed Jordan's debt to $27 billion, or almost 80% of GDP, and that looks like it'll only keep going up. Now, the IMF does expect Jordan's economy to expand 3.5% this year, up from last year's 2.9%. Well, let's get straight into it and speak to someone better placed than most to talk about Jordan's economy. It's the Jordanian Finance Minister. Uh, Omaya Token is joining us from Amman. Minister, we thank you very much for your time indeed. Look, the fact is Jordan gets a lot of money from overseas, from the Gulf and from the US and from the International Monetary Fund. Tell me about the state of your economy and if it can cope, potentially, without all that extra money. Well, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. In fact, uh, we do get support from the international community, in particular from our uh, brothers in the GCC countries. Uh, however, our burden is really um, as, as uh, uh, heavy. Um, uh, basically, the, the interruption of the Egyptian gas has caused us uh, uh, an extra cost since 2011 of around uh, 5 billion JDs. Also the Syrian burden uh, or the burden of the re refugees due to the Syrian crisis uh, is also estimated around 5 billion dollars since 2011. Now this, uh, the both amounts um, to 8.5 billion JDs. Now, uh, our stock of debt is 20 billion. So really it's a substantive amount to be financed purely by us. And, and this is why it's very important that we get financing uh, on easy terms or as grants from uh, the United States, from the GCC, Japan and other donors. So it's, it's really to carry the burden of, of the Syrian crisis as well as the regional uh, outcome due to the interruption of the Egyptian gas. You use that word burden quite often, Minister, and I think it is an appropriate one, really. Um, it is a burden, the amount of refugees over the years, Palestinians, Syrians, Iraqis. Why does Jordan keep doing it, keep stretching itself so much? Well, honestly, it's, uh, yes, we're doing it since we were established. We welcome any uh, person who, who needs uh, support or help. And, of course, this is a humane um, outlook. And I think it's a Hashemite uh, character, really, since we were established. So I think we are proud of that. Mm. We, we will continue to receive uh, anyone who needs help. But also, I think it has other um, important um, uh, results, such as neutralizing the extremist tendencies, for instance. If you help people who need, really, support, 
Uh, I think you are also neutralizing any extremist tendencies in the region. And, you know, this issue is becoming more and more important in our region. We have to um, uh, address the, this, this extremist, uh, uh, increasing extremist uh, behavior or tendencies. And I think one way to do that is, is uh, to help those who need uh, support. Okay, do you feel you're starting to make inroads with this money? Let me talk about jobs, for example, because jobs is an important issue anywhere in the world, I think. Uh, Jordan, I believe, it's got about 12.2% unemployment. This money that comes in, are you able to put it to work, make it create jobs and create opportunities uh, for your own people in the end? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, I think this is uh, really uh, a challenge, a big challenge, uh, not only in Jordan uh, or uh, that Jordan faces, but most countries. The issue really is austerity versus growth or creating jobs. Uh, as you know, most countries in Europe, uh, around the world and in our region, uh, did pursue austerity measures to bring back the fiscal balance. Now, to... to uh, um, uh, to have growth, GDP growth, uh, which basically comes from investment spending, uh, we have to rely on the savings of the private sector because governments, as I mentioned, are trying to introduce austerity measures to restore fiscal balance. So for private sector savings to finance uh, investment projects, your business environment has to be inviting and friendly to investors. Therefore, there is lots of work we are doing in Jordan towards improving the business environment so that international investors as well as uh, Jordanian investors would be more forthcoming in financing the, inf the investment projects. Uh, but you are right, it's a, it's a tough balance uh, to have austerity and growth or creating jobs. Okay, tell me then, Minister, about public side of things because you talked a lot about the private sector there and what it can do but I would like to know about the public side of things you know we saw Egypt cut its subsidies recently that's probably something you'd have to do at some stage and that would be very unpopular I would imagine yes we already did that sure we already did that in Jordan uh, towards the end actually of uh, 2012 we did take measures um, to redirect what was called generalized subsidies you know most countries uh, including developing countries, uh, we had um, a social protection schemes, if you like, in the form of general subsidies, which means you subsidize the commodity, in particular energy. Um, and, and that was a, a big mistake, actually, because it did subsidize the rich and the poor equally. And, of course, the rich consume much more than the poor, and so the rich benefited much more from this generalized subsidies. Of course, in Jordan, we have a plan or, uh, by 2017. We hope that the uh, electricity, for instance, would recover its cost, and therefore that would save uh, resources uh, for the government, which can be directed to education, health, and, and other sectors. What Egypt did recently uh, by raising the price of, of oil uh, derivatives, I guess, um, by over 70%, I must say, is a very bold decision and in the right direction. And for the same reasons that I mentioned, the generalized subsidy um, benefits the rich much more than the poor. Mm. And the amounts are tremendous, by the way. There is an IMF report which suggests <coughs> that the generalized subsidies in the region, the MENA region, is over $200 billion. And what about then, Minister, about Jordan's uh, shale oil deposits, which I've read about? That is something, well, is it, is it realistic? Can it have an impact on energy and on the wider economy? Oh, yes, definitely. And we signed um, uh, an agreement or a contract with, the, uh, with, a private, with an international private sector company to pursue this project. Uh, now, we did also pursue renewable sources of other renewable sources of energy, such as uh, solar and wind. And we did sign with, uh, I think, over 20 companies by now uh, to start producing uh, energy or electricity from renewable sources. 
Now, uh, also we are working towards liquid gas to, to, to generate electricity from liquid gas and we are building in Aqaba the terminal that will enable us to do that. Now, all these efforts, uh, of course, it takes time to produce results and so on. I think by 2016, 2017, we will be uh, in a much better position as far as our energy uh, needs are concerned and we would then be able to produce most of our needs of energy um, from the renewable sources as well as the liquid gas and gas also. Umayyad Tukan, the Jordanian finance minister in Amman, we thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Kamal. And still ahead on counting the cost, deciding Indonesia's future, who and how to take one of Asia's rising powers forward. Right now, though, we look at Egypt, a nation drowning in debt and one that, without the largesse of Gulf nations, would have probably been bankrupted by now. And so Egypt's finally faced up to its economic problems by eliminating subsidies. And as a result, fuel prices rose as much as 78%. Egypt's president, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, though, said the steps were long overdue. We will need two years of hard work and difficult decisions to confront the poverty that has been pressuring us for years. The dangers to the economy are great, so I couldn't delay the decision to partially lift subsidies, even if it cost me my position and support. But such claims don't seem to wash with the Egyptian people. Ahmed Idris takes us through some of the reaction to the cuts in subsidies. These are indeed difficult times for Egyptians. They now have to pay more for petrol. The price has gone up by 70%, and that is making a lot of them angry. This is about the people's livelihoods. This is not going to work. Do they assume that the Egyptian people are just passive and they would just accept anything? They can't go after the rich guys, so they are targeting the poor people. What can the poor man do in order to survive? What can the government worker who hardly makes any money do? The minister is sitting in comfort behind his desk, but I want you to go onto the streets and see how the people are suffering. Taxi and truck drivers are also protesting against the increase. Many of them say it will run them out of business. The customers tell me to complain to the government, but what can I do? I have four children to take care of. How can I pay the 60% increase on my own? But Egypt's prime minister has defended the hike, saying it's necessary to help the government balance its budget. This government is not against the poor people. This government is working to fix things. Go and look at the conditions our hospitals are in. But the people protesting on the streets say they are angry. And petrol price increase is not the only thing on their mind. Natural gas and electricity tariffs have also gone up. Many say the price increase runs counter to election promises made by former general, now President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who had promised to remove the subsidies gradually and that the burden will not be on the poor. Now the people see it differently. Yeah, they certainly, perhaps understandably, do see it differently. But President al-Sisi says Egyptians need to make sacrifices and he's taking the lead by only taking half his salary. And really, subsidies are the place to start making cuts. They account for more than 30% of Egypt's budget, which is a lot. Uh, in fact, on energy subsidies alone, Egypt spent $96 billion over the last decade. By cutting them, savings could reach around $7 billion, which is about 2.5% of economic output. But remember we used the phrase drowning in debt earlier. Well, it wasn't without good reason. Egypt's budget deficit stands at 9.5% of GDP. Alarmingly, it could have been 15% of GDP without the $20 billion or so it's received from Gulf states. All told, Egypt's debt situation is a pretty unhealthy 94% of GDP. And then there's the spending we don't know about, namely the military. This is literally a state secret. However, the estimate is that Egypt spends $4.4 billion a year on the military, excluding the $1.2 billion it gets from the United States in military aid. But the military also has its own business empire, if you like, which accounts for between 5 and 40% of the economy. These are businesses which pay no taxes. So the short story is Egypt's got some economic problems. Let's expand on that, shall we, with Angus Blair in Cairo. He's president of the economic think tank, the Signet Institute. Angus, subsidies, subsidies, subsidies. This is always an issue in Egypt. We have this cut, which has happened, but we should also be clear that the food subsidies are still in place for now. 
Uh, is that to assume then that there is more pain to come for Egyptians? No, food, the food subsidy will remain. It'll be better targeted uh, through cash payments as well as the smart card system. But the government needs better fiscal maneuverability and the fuel subsidy really had to go, it was outrageous because it helped the, the rich, mainly 80% of fuel went towards the top 20% of the population. But in terms of food, the food subsidy will stay, but that would be too politically contentious to touch, but it would be better targeted to cut wastage. That said, can we say that successive governments in Egypt have really failed to get a grip on this whole subsidy issue and that, you know, that's why it's become such a big deal uh, when the cut's finally made? Well, historically, most governments in the past, I think, were too afraid of the reaction of the street. And that came about, I think, partially as a result of some reforms that President Sadat tried to do. And then uh, President Mubarak tried to do also, that there were uh, basically uh, rioting, food riots, the last time in about 2008 in Egypt, when global food prices were very high. So the end result is that most governments were afraid of the reaction of the street by tra trying to tackle the fuel subsidies. I think now with population growth at 2.6% per annum, so it's an extra near enough 2 million, just under 2 million in Egyptian, extra Egyptians every year, and the fact that the government needed more money from the constitution to spend on health and education, as well as just freeing up some extra cash to use far more productively, really has become a necessity. And the, really, the longer it waited, the, the, the government was waiting, the far greater the cost. So something had to give, and it was the fuel subsidy. But when you reduce subsidies, uh, inflation tends to tick up. It, would that be the expectation here too? Yes, there'll be a one-off increase. Some of it will be painful, uh, particularly if it's related to food. But I think the government's already announced that some plans to sell in the sun shops uh, some key foods items more cheaply. But I think this really ought to be seen as a package, and there really should be, I think, a clearer package of what this means for Egypt. Uh, in terms of the overall economic scheme, because clearly there are, there are monopolies too and oligopolies which control a whole variety of goods. I think that those need to be broken up. I think there needs to be almost an agricultural revolution to increase food production in Egypt and cut waste. The World Bank estimates around half of all food in Egypt spoiled by the time it reaches the marketplace. If Egypt increased food production, which would be very easy, given it has water and it's got heat, uh, and given that if you could also cut wastage and improve logistics, then I think that food prices would come down. But inflation is a, a key issue here. I've talked about it now for over 20 years. And it's a, a structural issue within Egypt that needs to be addressed. Obviously, it's one of the world's biggest importers of wheat, too. So it's, it's a, from a food security issue, it's also important if in, uh, in the summer, for example, if global wheat harvests were lower than normal, which is likely with El Nino this year, uh, then Egypt might face increased price uh, for its imported wheat as well. Angus Blair talking Egypt with us on Counting the Cost. Thank you for that, Angus. You're very welcome. Hopefully do this again. You know, over the last decade, the Indonesian economy has made some remarkable progress. You can put a lot of that down to the guidance of President Susilo Bangbang Yudhoyono. But with a new president on the way, that'll be a tough act to follow. The economy's averaged growth of 5.8% in the 10 years through 2013. Debt's been slashed from 95% of GDP in 2000 to only 26% last year, helped by a law which caps the budget deficit at 3% of GDP. That's all good news, isn't it? But there could be even better to come. If Indonesia's economy continues to expand at 5% or more, it could be a trillion-dollar economy by 2015. GDP per person would rise from $3,500 to $8,500 by 2024, and the consumer market could more than double to $1.3 billion by 2023. But as we say, it's about what a new president can do with all that potential. Here's our Jakarta correspondent, Step Varsan, with some thoughts on that. After a very dramatic day on Wednesday with two candidates claiming victory and having their own celebrations, Indonesians have now woken up to great confusion. And the newspapers are symbolizing this confusion very well. This newspaper says, a people's victory, saying that Jokowi, Jakarta's governor, has clearly won. And this newspaper says a nation awaits. After tensions were building up on Wednesday night when former General Prabowo Subianto said that the declaration of victory by his contender Jokowi was far too early, both candidates were called by President Giudiono and they basically made an agreement to wait until the official results come out on July 22nd. There's a lot of fear though that this result on that day, the official result will be different than the result we saw yesterday 
where in the quick count, which has been proven reliable in the past, Joko Wee was a winner by a margin of around 5%. The question is now if in the next two weeks, supporters of both candidates will be patient enough to wait for the official result. And also, what will happen then? If the result is significantly different than what we saw yesterday, then we're in for a long legal battle. So, yeah, there are huge challenges ahead for Indonesia, and we want to discuss that with uh, Rajiv Biswas, joining us uh, from Zurich, actually, via Skype, but he is the chief Asia-Pacific economist with IHS. Rajiv, we're talking about another Asian country here which has all this growth, all this potential, but still so many issues as well, uh, the corruption, the, the poor education and health systems. Do you think it looks like Indonesia will have the right person to take it forward? Once we see the election results are finally declared, and if uh, Jokowi actually you know, becomes the president and leads a coalition government, he will be very focused on infrastructure development uh, and also combating corruption, which is another of Indonesia's great challenges. So I think he is going to be you know, very focused on addressing some of uh, Indonesia's key challenges to improve its business climate and areas where international investors are looking for improvement. However, where there are more concerns is whether he is going to continue to uh, push for uh, internationalization of the Indonesian economy. Uh, both presidential candidates have had uh, undertones of nationalism in their platforms to varying degrees. And I think the concern from the point of view of global investors would be if Indonesia moves away from a pro-international uh, agenda in terms of its reforms and moves in the direction of a more nationalistic uh, approach. Because I think that will not only uh, detract from global investment into Indonesia, but it will also scupper Indonesia's relations with other ASEAN countries, given the ASEAN region is trying to uh, create much greater economic integration. Uh, something we looked at earlier in our program, Rajiv, was the subsidy situation in Egypt. Uh, in Indonesia, I believe, you've still got these you know, ballooning fuel subsidies, and then you've got the widening budget deficits as well. Are these things which can be addressed? How does Indonesia get a grip on them? I think in the area of fuel subsidies, uh, it, Indonesia has been trying to reduce fuel subsidies, and it's likely that the incoming government will also try to make further progress with reducing subsidies uh, for fuel, because I think it's quite well understood that it's necessary to do that in order to create room in the budget to spend in other areas, particularly because uh, Joko is very keen to promote infrastructure development, so they need some leeway in the budget uh, to do that. Indonesia does have a very good uh, macroeconomic position in terms of its government debt to GDP ratio, which is uh, below 25%, very low by international standards. But they are very focused on their fiscal deficit, and that has slipped somewhat. So they're probably going to try very hard to reduce some of the subsidies uh, in order to focus spending in areas where it's more productive a more efficient use of government resources. Final thought then, Rajiv, and it kind of goes back to the first question I asked you. Um, your own research shows you're expecting Indonesia to become a trillion dollar economy, which sounds great. I'm wondering if it is still possible, though, with all the things we mentioned in that first question, the corruption and the, the work that needs to be done on the education and the health services and those issues. Well, uh, Indonesia is already very, very close to becoming a trillion US dollar economy. In fact, if it grows at around about 5.5% next year, as we expect, it should actually reach that threshold already by 2015. So it's on the threshold of becoming one of Asia's few trillion dollar economies. Uh, the challenge, I think, is whether it can double again by 2022, which we do have in our baseline forecast for Indonesia, that by 2022, its GDP doubles to $2 trillion. Uh, and I think that's achievable, but a lot of this will depend on whether the new government can really focus on further economic reforms, making Indonesia more competitive for manufacturing. Uh, one of the big problems Indonesia needs to address is creating jobs for its young people entering the workforce. Uh, it's a very young demographic, 
but it also means they need to create a lot of jobs. So one of the big challenges for the new government is to really create a much more dynamic business climate that will make Indonesia much more attractive for foreign investment into manufacturing and make Indonesia more of a manufacturing export hub. That is Rajiv Biswas from IHS talking Indonesia with us. Thanks, Rajiv. You're most welcome. And there you go. That's our show for this week. But more for you online at aljazeera.com slash programs. Now, the Counting the Cost page has been revamped. Lots more individual features are up there now. Uh, reports, links to other business programs and stories from Al Jazeera. So do have a look at that. Um, and tell us what you think about it, won't you? Uh, tweet either me, at Kamal AJE, or our business editor, at Arvid Oliver Ali. And do use the hashtag Counting the Cost. It'll appear on our website that way. Uh, or just use an email. Why don't you? Counting the Cost at aljazeera.net is the address. But that is it for this edition of Counting the cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.